The Texas Parks and Wildlife Television Series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. Through your purchases of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels, over $50 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. Additional funding provided by Ram Trucks. Guts. Glory. Ram. Coming up on Texas Parks and Wildlife. And this is almost like therapy for me, because it, it doesn't exist out here. It's just gone. It goes away. I think a lot of people just are not aware of our state parks or the opportunities that they can find within our parks. We're trying really hard to uh, protect the skies, keep the skies dark. Texas Parks and Wildlife, a television series for all outdoors. Robin Bradbury and her husband Steve just arrived at Mason Mountain Wildlife Management Area. This is a good spot though. Yeah, I know. They are here for a public deer hunt. So I'm gonna put out not a lot of corn, but I'm gonna scatter quite a bit. Make them work for so, it. Yeah, exactly. Still too thick right here, but I'll be able to see them. Yeah. Our hunting strategies go hand in hand. And there's quite a few tracks right here. She's extremely good at seeing signs and finding a good area. I'm pretty good at reading the land, you know, seeing which way the wind's going and things like that. Bye. Bye. Love, Love you. you. Love you too. Bye bye. I like it. I've never hunted in any place quite this open before, so I'm curious to see what shows up and how they move. Steve calls it nesting. It's good. Steve sets up about a mile away. Just getting settled in. I think we've got it positioned where just ease the gun out there. Well, there's limb deer and bush deer and leaf deer, rock deer, lots of rock deer. Well, when you haven't seen anything for a while, the mind starts making things into deer. Robin has to keep her mind at ease, relaxed. If I get into a situation I'm not comfortable with, then I shut down, go away. It really shows up. It is autism. Robin has high-functioning autism. It's sort of like Asperger's, but with a much higher incidence of anxiety, stress, and depression. I didn't go to prom, any dances. I don't dance, it's way too close. But like I said, I don't really, I don't miss anything, because I don't know what it's like to have it. I don't want to talk about that anymore. Robin is like many others on the autism spectrum. <laughs> she does better away from the high energy, high stress world where most of us live our lives. Never, I mean, fidget, stormy. My chickens lay different colored eggs. There's brown eggs and white eggs, and occasionally I get a pink egg. Mop eggs! You always know deep down, you know you don't quite fit in, but you really want to, but you never will. What, this Come bucket? Where oh, you want that? This bucket? Are you sure? Most high functionings have learned coping mechanisms. Come, here. Come on. I think that's why animal therapy is so good for autism. These are all rocks that I've picked up over the years and a few artifacts. Other kids, you know, they're home playing video games and stuff and I'm climbing in dirt piles looking for fossils. Even at an early age, she knew she was dealing with something. Thinking back, I did, I just didn't know it because it was normal to me. 
it was never pointed out, well, that's different. I was always called odd or strange or shy. It could be crowds at the store or on the way to an amusement park. This is it. Anxiety is there. I don't see too many people. This will be fine. I don't like it when people are behind me. I can't see them. It's my personal space issue. And how far away someone is really depends on the situation and who I'm with. So I, I don't like people behind me. I, I can put up with it. I just don't care for it. Yes, girl, we're written here, gentlemen. There was a redfish. Yeah. I don't know how to explain it. It doesn't bother me at all. No, no food for you. Don't try to distract her. Try to keep her close. Keep her mind off of it. Why are you flexing? I, what? I don't think I'd be who I am if it wasn't for Steve. You're imagining things. No. He's my support. He's really sensitive to when I'm getting uncomfortable. And he's always there. Robin conquers her autism because of places like Mason Mountain. Here, her fears fade away. This is almost like therapy for me, because it, it doesn't exist out here. It, it's just gone. It goes away. It, it's on the other side of that gate up front. This is not out here. It's more serene out here. You don't have all of the movement of people and distractions. You come out here and you can focus on your surroundings more. You don't have to worry about avoiding people and... <laughs> and listen. And you can listen, exactly. Listen, there's nothing. There's wind, there's crickets. You don't have access to a lease or any way to, to go out on your own. You can get into these Texas hunts and get after some of these animals that you wouldn't be able to otherwise. Wind's picking up a little bit. Not too bad, though. I grew up in the city, so being able to come out here in the quiet solitude and just be able to watch all the critters, watch nature. That's what I get out of it. There's movement, there's turkey. You see the turkey? And as the day ends, Robin sees much more than a couple gobblers. Don't move. There's deer. There's deer. She's looking right at us. Okay. I'm trying to get my gun off. She's got a spin. Don't move. Let me see us. She's down. Yes. Yes. I got a deer. <laughs> I got a deer. Let's go see her. Oh man, I could barely keep the gun still. The scope kept jumping around for some reason. It's your heart. Oh, yeah, that. Oh, it was thumbing. I couldn't hear anything except that. Bum, 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 bum. I feel great. I just harvested my first hill country doe. This is wonderful. That's some good meat there too. She's gonna be good eating. Taking it through the woods. No, my, my autism, I can function with it. Some people, they've lost arms, legs, they're dealing with cancer. I, I've got off easy. Hi, big boy. There will always be obstacles to overcome in life. How you choose to overcome them is a personal choice. For Robin, she chooses how she lives her life. If this is the worst thing that happens to me, my life is great. Now look at this. My life is great.
We're in the middle of our prairie dog town right now. It's, it's part of our big process of, of restoring the park back to what it would have looked like prior to European settlement. Historically, prairie dogs were just totally abundant in, in Texas and the entire Southwest. But they have been reduced to about 2% of the original habitat. So we're giving them a sanctuary. We're restoring them into the park, giving them a sanctuary where they can be prairie dogs. Are all these burrows that they uh, make, are they all interconnected? You know, many people think that all of the prairie dog burrows are all connected to each other within the town, but they're actually just connected within the cotteries, and cotteries are the family of prairie dogs. They're usually made up of one male and maybe four or five females. You know, the bison wander through here. And then the people can walk right around here and watch this all happen at the same time. Look, there's two babies. See? Oh, look. See the two babies coming out of the hole? Yeah. <laughs> now, the pups are born three months ago or so. We've got a few of them already popping up. And now we got a bunch of little babies running around. It's really neat to see. Our goal here at the park is to restore it to what it would have looked like 300 years ago, thereby giving the people that come, the visitors, the opportunity to see wildlife in a natural setting. We are restoring an indigenous wildlife to its native habitat. This is its historic home. summer, right? So we want to get some air going through. It's that moment when someone gets something new or learns something new, catches that first fish, figures out how to set up their tent. I think that's what keeps me in the environment of teaching new people, is that newness always excites me. Kids that play outside are healthier, they're happier, and they're smarter. So you've already taken steps to improve your children's lives by simply bringing them out today. And I was just tired of being behind a desk. And so I wrote down that I want to be an outdoor educator and guide. And within a year, I left the corporate world and started doing this. Working for Texas Outdoor Family, I spend every weekend in a park. It's been incredible to think of the, the adventures I've been on and the areas I've been able to personally experience in the outdoors in the 10 years that I've been doing outdoor education has been great. Kim is just such an excellent outdoor leader that she is so skilled at connecting audiences to the natural resources and the fun to be had outside. And do not leave any food out. I had a family camp on this corner one time and they lost their entire breakfast because the raccoon opened the cooler and ate everything inside. In 2013, we shifted our model for Texas Outdoor Family to include community partnerships and we partner with nonprofits, government agencies, school groups, community rec centers, and our goal is to reach a broader audience by utilizing the members in those communities to help us gather families and youth to come out and camp with us. We have 25 partner groups that camp with us in Houston. Out of those 25 partner groups, they're coming back season after season. Kim is amazing. From the very beginning, she's always been very outgoing, and she said, hey, let us teach you everything we know, and you can go out and claim it and teach it to as many people as you can. I've always loved that about Kim. I think a lot of people just are not aware of our state parks or the opportunities that they can find within our parks. And so when we are able to find a community leader that can encourage people to get outdoors, uh, their voice really becomes our voice and allows us to, to connect to more people. There are so many benefits to partnering with Texas Outdoor Family. They help you host the events, they train you in everything you need to know, and they help out with the camping gear that we need to provide to these first-time camping families as well. If you've never built a fire, I've got a whole crew of leaders over here that can help you and you can work with them to build a fire. We also have some Dutch oven cooking happening tonight. If they come out once and they have a great time, that really doesn't make a life lasting impact. But when they come out and they spend three or four weekends in different parks and different environments, 
then I think we're truly able to, to sort of connect them to our natural resources and, and give them opportunity to see that there's even more adventure. There's something magical about this place. It, it's like nothing else. We're trying really hard to uh, protect the skies, keep the skies dark. Without the dark skies here, we, we'd be in a world hurt. It's beginning to encroach on us. The uh, dark skies, the remote location, uh, the high elevation, the dry climate, and the southerly location all combine to, to make this uh, an ideal spot for, for an observatory. McDonald historically, and certainly uh, ongoing today, has had a very active public outreach education program. Astronomy is an excellent vehicle for science education in the country. I don't have the, the technical inclination to be a, you know, an astrophysicist. The, the math and the physics stuff uh, escapes me. The biggest part of my job responsibilities are maintaining the, the dark skies, keeping the skies dark for the observatory. Dark sky just means the lack of any artificial light sources, the anthropogenic light, uh, man-made, you know, human origin light sources. It's a relatively recent phenomenon. I mean, light pollution wasn't a term anybody would have understood 100 years ago. And astronomers are kind of like the canaries in the coal mine. We're the first ones to say, hey, wait a second, the skies here aren't as dark as they used to be. Tens of billions of dollars a year worldwide is, is just wasted up into the night sky. Uh, light that's doing nobody any good whatsoever and is blocking our view of the stars. One of my earliest memories is uh, watching the moon rise through a pair of binoculars leaned up against a window. Ever since then, I've been fascinated by the night sky and looking through telescopes. It's gonna look like a garage sale in here. The new uh, upgraded parts are still being attached to the telescope. There we go. Yeah, it doesn't even look like it. I mean, I've had people come in here and go, so where's the telescope, you know? The amount of data collected by the telescope is uh, about to dramatically increase. Gathering light from some galaxies that are 10, 12 billion light years distant, very faint objects. Um, we're talking about maybe a dozen or so photons per hour will be collected by the telescope. So if the, the background sky gets brighter than the faint objects we're trying to uh, observe, then uh, we lose them, or they're lost for observation. So um, it's critical that we maintain the dark skies here at, at McDonald Observatory in West Texas. It's an amazing project, it's really remarkable. Can't wait to get on a star. When you say pollution, you don't think of light as being in that category of pollution. So uh, it's not something you think you're doing wrong. And when I talk about the dark skies, I try to help people understand how easy it is to preserve them. All it is is a choice you make at Home Depot to buy the light that points down instead of points up. And doing it here, I think, is important because people can see the dark sky. And once people kind of get a, an idea of to what they could have in their backyard, they're more motivated to go and make those right decisions. You can come into this community at night and you'll think, you know, where'd the power go? 
because we as a group, you know, keep our night lights either directed downwards or don't use them, but it's encroaching from, from other areas, particularly the oil patch in Permian Basin. The only way to keep McDonald Observatory working and safe and viable is for dark skies. We've seen the glow along the horizon to our northeast steadily increase. We are not against outdoor lighting at night. This is not an anti-light campaign. We're trying to promote good lighting. First off, there are ordinances in place, outdoor lighting ordinances in place in the uh, seven counties that surround McDonald Observatory um, that basically ask that light be kept on the ground and out of the sky. Within the seven counties, the Texas Railroad Commission has let right at 5,000 permits in five years uh, to drill uh, for oil and gas, and that's just the drilling. Uh, that doesn't take into account all the facilities that go along uh, with, uh, with oil and gas production. So there are literally thousands of installations within the region that's protected by law uh, to keep the skies dark. I don't think a single oil and gas operator even knew that there was a lighting ordinance in place. Our ability to, to enforce a dark skies ordinance type thing sort of ends at the county line. For us, there are just so many things we can't do. We're not talking about enforcement, we're talking about education. You can force people to do a lot of things, but the better thing is to educate people how important this is. I've been to probably a dozen major conventions over the past year and a half. Bill's a great guy. I mean, you know, he can sell this, and he does sell this, and he goes around, and, and you know, that's, that's what we have to do is educate. It's not a technical problem, it's an educational problem. I don't think there's anybody that's insensitive or doesn't care, it's just not a blip on their radar screen. A lot of them will say, well, I never really thought about it before. Uh, but once they do, it's like, well, sure, this is, you know, this is the problem that we don't need to have. If we can just keep the light on their work and out of the sky, problem solved. Going to a state park in a place away from the city, it's a really majestic feeling. We're really using our state parks as demonstration sites. We'll just do a tour of the constellations and people can learn a little bit. And then we'll start talking to people about light pollution and how they themselves can help reduce some of the light pollution. Because when you do go and see the Milky Way, it's a really inspiring sight. Today, Enchanted Rock joins an elite group of park, preserves, and other conservation areas worldwide as an IDA International Dark Sky Park. We look forward to a long and enduring relationship with Enchanted Rocks and Texas Parks and Wildlife that will help us keep the stars at, at night truly big and bright. Please accept this award with our compliments. Congratulations, Doug. Really, man. Thank you. Yeah, you did, you've done so much. You've done so much. Do people living in urban areas notice that they're missing anything? Some don't. But if they've never really seen it, then it's, uh, it's hard to convey um, the meaning or the value that it might have. There's nothing quite like um, getting out under a starry sky and actually seeing it for yourself. Shorter length ones, yeah. This that's one? Should, that should work, yeah. Yeah, I don't want a deck. It's painful. If I slip, mm -hmm. then it'll lock. And then to let me down, I just hold that one like there and pull up on that. But if you let me fall on that, then I'll die. Jesus, it's, and I have a uh, cliff bar and some protein shakes, and water, of course. And go!
Yeah. Let's do it. This climb is called Solo. It's a 5.8. There you go, well. Solid. Got it. Keep your breathing. You can do it well. Where are those power noises at? This series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. Through your purchases of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels, over $50 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. Additional funding provided by Ram Trucks. Guts. Glory. Ram.